morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for joining. At CIQ, we're focused on powering the next generation of software infrastructure, leveraging the capabilities of cloud, hyperscale, and HPC. From research to the enterprise, our customers rely on us for the ultimate Rocky Linux, Werewolf, and Aptainer support escalation. We provide deep development capabilities and solutions, all delivered in the collaborative spirit of open source. Dude, what's up? How are you? <laughs> Welcome, oh gosh, everyone. That was so weird. While your like little thing was doing the intro, I got nervous. I think it's because we haven't been on for like a couple of weeks live, and couple I started to get like, yeah, like the like the jitters, like the nervous panicky. <laughs> I started trying to make sure everything was turned on. It sounds different in my headset today, so um, we're off. Yeah, we're off. Yeah. Right. I hear you. I think we all have these issues, right? It's like, where's the camera? Where's the screen? Where's the monitor? Where's my volume? Like, <laughs> it's just all over the place. Ooh, well, hopefully okay, Forrest so really good to see him. What's that? Yeah, you do. I said, I hope Forrest isn't off today. Oh, yeah, that'd be weird. Well, you know, I have a sneaking suspicion that he has been planning and scheming and looking forward to today for quite a while this guy Probably. he is like yeah yeah he, i mean to like he gets so interested and curious about new things and new technologies and ways to put things together and so he has been deep diving into what is going on with this i want to call it yama i know it's not yama i know i know but okay. in my mind, as I'm looking at it, I want to call it Yama. So today we're going to be talking about deploying Meta's Llama with Aptainer on GCP optimized Rocky Linux woo -woo, with GPUs. <sighs> that is a mouthful and it's going to be rad. It is a lot. And I fully anticipated you having a Llama behind you, but I guess I was wrong. Oh Sorry. my God. I expected I it. I have disappointed all my fans out there. I am so sorry. <laughs> it will never happen again. <laughs> it's all right. Maybe Forrest will have a llama. Okay, that would be amazing. That would be amazing. All right, so where 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 is this man? Bring him on. Yes, Andy. Oh, Godlove. we got Doctor Godlove too. What? Amazing. Yes. It's okay. Like a surprise cameo. This is kind of exciting. <laughs> Good to see you guys. You. Thank you. Very, very cool. Great to see you all. Is this working? We can it is working. You. Awesome. Great to see everyone. Dave. Hey, I decided to just drop in and see what Forrest is working on. It looks super duper cool. I know. I it's know. awesome. I'll I'll actually I'll be I'll be right back. Oh. Uh oh. Okay. <clears throat> so while he's gone, Forrest, I think we we talked about what these models are before and kind of what you're going to go into but i think it would be good to level set kind of the base of what is it we're talking about not just llama but in general what is it and kind of what are people doing with it before you dive in yeah so good afternoon everyone good to see you all today uh <clears throat> yeah so this year has seen uh kind of the, over the past year in general we've seen a huge kind of rise in the large language model well there's no, hasn't really been um the same level of kind of development around, you know, text-based AI and these language models like this before, um, with kind of the huge explosion in generative AI in the past year and a half or so in general, um, we kind of saw, you know, this come out around text-based content with ChatGPT first in um, December or so of last year. Um, and since then, the sphere has just kind of been getting more and more developed. Um, one of the biggest things that's gone on uh, kind of in the space is the race to create uh, models that are not proprietary. So everybody wants now large language models and everything. It's, you know, there are, <laughs> uh, you know, whole startups that are being funded just on, you know, wrappers around. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Oh you made it. You got it done. I... From LOL cows to the llama. It's coming through for us. He's got the whole farm there. Sorry to interrupt. I just heard the llamas were requested. So that's awesome. Magic, dude. Magic. See, you still have young kids. That's what I was thinking. I was like, man, if my kid was still young, I know I'd have one. <laughs> oh, super cute. Thank you. Very Dave. Cool. 
Very cool. Um, All right, Forrest. Startups being funded on these models. Yeah. So there's, you know, there's whole uh, like startups at the moment that are uh, basically just wrappers around the open AI APIs, um, which is kind of funny. Uh, but um, since kind of, like I said, this generative AI boom started, and especially since ChatGPT kind of showed us uh, what, you know, text based generative AI uh, can bring to us as far as capacity goes. There's kind of been a race to free the entire LLM space from kind of the proprietary world. Um, like I said, everything that you know, OpenAI, ChatGPT, all that's proprietary. You can't actually get uh, access to those underlying model files and go like deploy them out on your own architecture. So there's kind of been um, over the past, even like before ChatGPT came out, there's kind of been a little bit of a history of open source language models that people have used. Um, kind of generally in the GPT space. Uh, you know, there's been GPT one, two, three, four, etc. There's you know kind of been development in that space for a long time. Um, so there have been uh, kind of open source large language models before, um, like GPT J and GPT uh, Neo X twenty B uh, are were the two biggest ones and kind of the standard in around May of uh, March May or so of twenty twenty two. One thing that's interesting is that at the start of this year, I saw tons of businesses kind of creating their own little come and train your AI, build a custom version of one of these models with your you know, custom fine tuning data. And they basically offer GPT-J and GPT-Neo X20B. Um, that was basically what there was in the space as far as open source AI, that was kind of the standard of what people used. There's a couple other models, uh, things like Bloom, for example, but in general, uh, what I kind of saw was that the space had mostly standard around the, uh, standardized around those two GPT ones because they, were the easiest to kind of, uh, they were already, they were um, the ones that were already most kind of suited to chat based applications. And they were kind of the easiest and some of the lightest weight to go and take and fine tune on your own. Um, even then, they took quite a large amount of architecture behind them to be able to fine tune. Uh, and so kind of into this year, uh, there were a few different developments that came out. There were a lot of places that kind of started to kind of seeing this chat GPT thing becoming bigger and bigger around um, December, January, uh, February, et cetera. Uh, a lot of places kind of started to take these uh, GPT-J and Neo X20B and build kind of a custom version of it um, so that, like I said, they could either, um, you know, put it out there as like, oh, this is our open source version that we've, you know, kind of made better. Um, or so that they could, you know, kind of put it behind, you know, paywall and like sell access to it. Uh, ultimately, um, like I said, a lot of these, it's, it's basically just kind of providing an easy interface to get into those models. Um, but there wasn't, there was kind of a lot of places that, uh, you know, you would start to like, look, I was trying to find, or I, I, this whole year I've kind of been looking basically at, you know, creating, a, you know, of course I'm getting in on the GPT craze too. So I'm, you know, kind of working with, uh, my own projects in the space, uh, but kind of looking for different solutions and open source models, I found frequently that, you know, like I said, around February or so, uh, there would be places that would announce, oh, we have this open source model, it's amazing, come take a look at it, and then you get there, and, you know, at the end of the whole, you know, model card, it's, this was trained on our custom, you know, proprietary whatever chip, you have to go and have one of these specific types of systems, or, you know, get access to our cloud platform to do this. I'm like, okay, well, this is not really the open source that I'm looking for. Um, the whole space kind of really switched up uh, when in about March, April or so, uh, Meta open sourced their Llama AI model. Um, basically, their original intention was to only provide access to it to like researchers, um, academic institutions, places like that. Like they had kind of a vetting process for who they were giving the actual model code to. Um, but then the model code got leaked like a week after this uh, out on the internet. And at that point, the cat was kind of out of the bag. Um, this, uh, there was a, and there are other kind of, I should just mention really quickly to digress, there are other kind of attempts in this space that I looked at, um, smaller models that turned out to be, you know, basically not, you know, usable for commercial use, um, stuff that, uh, there was like one called Dolly that I looked into for a while that um, ultimately uh, just kind of got outmoded when Lala came around. Uh, 
so anyway, they announced they're going to have a vetting process and that it's going to all kind of, oh, you only can get access to this, you know, by getting a hold of us, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and like a week later, it leaks and suddenly everyone has access to Llama. So then the big race after that, I was kind of like, okay, well, you know, I'm going to hold off on kind of experimentation more with these, uh, you know, two GPT type models because, uh, you know, we'll just kind of see where the space goes for a little bit and kind of what new standard maybe emerges out of this. Uh, and sure enough, the race was on after that was leaked to produce a commercially acceptable version of that code that people could actually go and base their models on. I'm not an attorney, so I don't really know how you take leaked code and turn that into a, or I don't know, I, you know, I'm, I'm also, you know, only really an amateur AI engineer. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly how people were able to somehow create model that gave basically the same performance, same functionality, or close enough to this leaked model um, to be able to release this. But that was called Open Llama, and that came out about a month and a half or so after uh, Llama itself was leaked. Um, so I kind of looked into that, but I was kind of a little bit like, well, Open Llama, that's a little, you know, that's how do you desanitize leaked code like that, you know, realistically? Um, and so other projects kind of pulled my attention away. Uh, I kind of ended up, you know, just looking at, you know, just other things that you do, kind of ebb and flow of work. Uh, I kind of also, like I said, put this aside just to kind of see what new standard kind of emerged from, you know, the cage fight that was going on between all these. Um, Open Llama, like I said, Dolly, all these different models were kind of competing at once, um, kind of into around June of this year. Uh, and the space kind of stayed that way for a few months. Um, it was kind of, you know, there wasn't any like huge, massive new, like huge news that came out until just about like two months ago or so um, when Meta came out with Llama 2. Uh, Llama 2 is their um, essentially genuinely, and I should mention that there have been people that have kind of called them out for calling this in general an open source model uh, because they didn't share, um, well, they've shared the code, they haven't shared like the underlying data sets and stuff like that, that um it was trained on uh of course they you know we never did quite find out i don't think how many parameters chat gpt has in it i think last i heard some people were saying that the it's trillions wasn't quite true and it's actually hypothetically like eight 200 billion parameter models that are all kind of fine-tuned um for different subject matters all kind of you know wizard of oz behind the curtain together um but anyway uh, so Meta 2 or Llama, uh, sorry, Llama 2 is released. Um, and like I said, you can, some people have kind of taken issue with how uh, Meta calls it, you know, open source, but in general, it's a really like robust chat LLM model that they uh, have essentially provided for free for any type of use. The only caveat in their terms of use is the first thing, you know, I got back into this sphere. I also see Llama or, or Llama 2 and I'm like, oh, it's open source. Wait, what? And um, kind of looking through the licensing agreements and stuff, it's, you know, pretty permissive. You can basically use it for whatever. But they do have a caveat in there that says, like, uh, if you have over 700 million users on your platform, or, like, if you're over $700 million in revenue, uh, something like that, I think it's revenue, you have to go and negotiate a separate license with them to use it. And they essentially did this so that it's kind of funny. They've enabled, a, you know, basically everyone on the small scale to use it but they have cut out like Google, their larger competitor, AWS, these larger competitors from taking it and using it because you gotta, you, know, you gotta license that with them. So um, there's a lot you can do uh, with this new AI model. It is super robust. It has, as far as I can tell, all of the care and attention of a professional engineering team behind it, basically, as opposed to kind of, I shouldn't say as opposed to, but kind of some of these other projects um, were not like the models themselves, but like some of the GPT things, the uh, the ways that a lot of people were deploying them wasn't actually like the model itself, but it was basically kind of like some basic scaffolding code that people had put together to enable like parallelism on GPUs with it. Um, and so I should mention this whole time I was kind of trying to containerize these different things with Aptainer along the way. Um, ultimately I kind of ran with like the GPT ones. I ultimately kind of ran into, um, problems even before I got to containerization with just getting like the basic kind of, you know, GitHub, readme type 
stuff up and running on it. Um, like I said, those models had kind of aged and the code bases that they were based on were kind of like, this was a one-off I wrote a year ago to enable, you know, this model to run that I decided to put out on GitHub that then kind of, you know, enough people over time contributed back into that it, um, it stayed afloat for a bit, but it was definitely by the time, you know, Llama was leaked, it was kind of starting to become obvious that uh, there was maybe kind of a need for something newer. I was like getting uh, Q to compatibility problems, different things like this. Um, so it's got, it, I just, I really like how they, it's one of those things that I find uh, my experience with Llama 2 so far has been one of those things that uh, kind of just works, if you know what I mean. It, you know, I was able to pull the GitHub. I was able to get the link from Meta. I was able to use it really easily. It just, uh, you know, pulled in the models just fine. It's uh, so the actual, the, I should back up a little bit. The process of actually getting the models themselves from Meta um, you go to their site, they've got kind of a form that you fill out that tells you a bunch of, or that gives you a, you know, it's kind of like name, your organization, that type of thing, what models you want. Uh, they've made available, I think a 7 billion, a 13 billion, and a 70 billion. It's either a 13 or a 20 billion in the middle, but it's a 70. I think it's uh, 13 the, when I looked at what you sent out. I think it is 13, you're right. 13, okay. Yeah, it's a seven, a 13, and a 70 billion parameter version. Um, and they actually have two code bases you can get from them. Uh, there's the Llama model itself, which has basically an untrained version of the model that they have just trained on their training data, but they haven't fine tuned for chat applications. And then they have another app, uh, version of it that they've done some fine tuning on um, to enable, to kind of make it better for, uh, um, for chat applications, essentially. Um, the trained one, you don't have to do what's called few shot prompting. Um, few shot prompting is where you give, you actually give the LLM a few examples of like question, answer, question, answer, question, blank, fill in the blank. And you have to like basically prompt it beforehand to like let it know what type of response you want. Um, their base model, you have to do that for queries, but their chat one will just take, you know, what is this? And it knows what to do with it. So that's their base model. They also have a code version of it that would, I think that they also have like a Python optimized version of that, that they've like specifically fine tuned for Python. Um, and so, yeah, they've, they've got a whole bunch of stuff that you can get from them. Um, once you submit your info pretty quickly, like a minute or so later, you get this link in an email that it says, go pull this GitHub, paste this link into this thing. Um, you know, do the Git pull, do all that type of stuff. Um, here in just a little bit, I'll kind of jump onto my instance maybe and show you guys uh, kind of what that looks like. Um, I probably won't pull the models because they're significant. Um, that's a lot of data, but I'll kind of show you what the end result of it is. Uh, you get, in the end, your like GitHub that you pulled with all these different, you know, basically model weights, files, stuff like that to work with. Um, and after that, the sky's kind of the limit. Like I said, I uh, I got this working. Uh, my environment for this was I went out to the Google Cloud and spun up one of the um, custom GCP optimized Rocky Linux images that are up there. Uh, that we've gone and specifically optimized with GCP to run best there. So I spun up a Rocky 8 version of that uh, with one of their, um, what is it called? It's an A2 Ultra GPU 1G instance. They have like this one instance in the Singapore region <laughs> that I'm able to get access to. In general, I can never get these things to spool up in any other place. And when I requested like a, a variety of uh, I'm running this on an A180 gigabyte uh, GPU. When I originally requested availability, I got basically one in Singapore and I'm like, yes, my GPU. <laughs> uh, so I was able to get one of those instances. Um, while you sometimes, you know, availability can sometimes be, uh, um, you know, always in the cloud. You can sometimes not get a GPU all the time. Uh, for the most part, it's pretty reliable and uh, I've been on there quite a bit since then, just kind of tinkering around, doing different stuff. Um, like I said, uh, GCP optimized Rocky Linux has worked great. I was able to uh, take basically just a standard NVIDIA uh, CUDA and driver install, bring that up on the instance, um, and have my GPU and everything working real easily. 
Um, and after that, like I said, I attached some block storage to this. So I could basically have two terabytes of scratch space to go put all the model files, containers, stuff like that into. Um, spun this up. And uh, like I said, did that whole process of getting the link from Meta, pulling all the models, um, and then getting all that kind of situated. Uh, once I've kind of gone through and figured out the basic steps that you have to do in order to get the uh, model up and running in general, just on you know bare metal, if you will, I went ahead and uh, translated those over into an app tainer. Overall, it was really simple in general to get up and running. It's not a very complex um, definition file. It's basically just kind of installing Python 3.9, so you can use that. Uh, installing some requirements files, doing a pip update, <clears throat> and then just uh, it, it's pretty simple. We'll take a look at it here in a second. Um, but before I kind of maybe hop onto my instance, are there any questions or anything like that? Any commentary? I think that was the one question I was going to ask was how hard was it to get into an Aptainer container? But you yeah. answered it already. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you here in just a moment. It was uh, yeah. it was surprisingly easy. I was very pleased. Let me clear that up. Every day was going to have to explain so. something. Yeah. Yeah, right? It was very thorough. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Like every question that came up, I'm like, what about this one? And then you just like went right through and like answered wow. everything. So we're going to get like a, a, what is this? So you said it's not really a demo, but we're just going to kind of get to see inside the container or what's happening here? I'll show you guys running it on my instance really quickly. I'm just okay, going to cool. show you what my workspace looks like after all of this. Um, like I said, I kind of just have been running this on a scratch base. I've also got this. Maybe if I have a chance, I'll show this at the end. I've also got this running on our Fuzzball platform at the moment, the same example that I'm going to show you here, um, which has been kind of fun to tinker around with. So maybe I'll show that here at the end. Uh, but yeah, so let me just jump onto my command line here really quickly. And actually, let me make the text bigger before I do that. Let's see here. While you're doing that, I was told my microphone was a little bit quiet, so I turned it up. What? Know. Oh, sorry. Huh? I couldn't hear you. <laughs> what? <laughs> so you made a reference to um, Llama being different than Chat GPT in mm -hmm. like a few different ways, but I don't know. My, that might be interesting. I guess you're going to show us so we're going to be able to see it. Like, so, well, yeah. I'll show you like just kind of like what the model looks like running. Um, GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer, I think, which refers to uh, essentially a specific architecture of model, of uh, large language model. There are different ways that these are built. Um, I, I think it's, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I think on some level, it's probably fair to say all GPTs are large language models, but not all large language models are GPTs. Okay. Um, GPT just happens to be like the architecture that OpenAI has found kind of works really well. And so there's been a lot of work around kind of generative pre-trained transformers in the field. Um, gosh, and I hope that that's actually what GPT stands for. Uh, it's a very yeah. intuitive name. Yeah. Makes total they, sense. Yeah, like I said, once again, it's um, you can kind of describe it at a very high level that all GPTs are LLMs, but not all LLMs are GPTs. And so there's um, just underlying architectural differences uh, between kind of, you know, between Llama and probably what OpenAI is doing that make them uh, kind of distinct uh, families of model. And I don't, I haven't like read an incredible amount into that. It's possible that Llama takes a little bit more from the GPT side of things, but I imagine that OpenAI, you know, that's kind of a lot of their more in-house stuff. So I imagine Meta probably has their approach. And I've read, um, the paper is very interesting and I wish I could remember the details from it, but they're not coming to me at the moment. I have a copy of it here, but, um, they have a whole paper where they go into how their architecture works and it's, uh, yeah, there's essentially just fundamental technical differences between that and like how a GPT would work. Um, and of course, this is open source. So we can take this and I mean, I can interact with it here on my, uh, let's see if this works. Yeah, I mean, you're not sharing anything yet. If I don't know if you're still trying to figure that out, but we're not seeing anything. Alex is my... Is <laughs> 
I just started sharing. Let right there now. be sharing. Okay. There it is. I just started. I just yeah. I just started trying it. Cool. <laughs> um. So yeah. Uh, one thing that's interesting, like I said, ChatGPT. Uh, one another big difference is that you can only really interact with it through APIs or through kind of proprietary portals. Um, you know, you're asking it something through their web interface. Uh, they are. I'm gonna make this just a tad bit bigger. Um, you know, you're interacting it uh, through API calls. You're interacting with it uh, um, through their web interface, that type of thing. It's all kind of proprietary. There is no like take the chat GPT model file, put it onto a Unix file system like we're looking at here and, you know, interact with it directly. This is, you know, Meta just gives you a GitHub. They give you all the files. They say here, this is, you know, the dependencies that you need in order to run this on stuff. And uh, we will kind of hop into what we're doing here. So my workspace so far, I'm uh, here in my instance. I've got one of these NVIDIA A100 SXM 80 GB GPUs. Um, you can see that it's mostly unused right now. It's just kind of sitting there idle. I'm pretty sure that I could do this on a smaller uh, GPU, but I just haven't got around to doing scaling tests up onto the 13B and 70B versions yet. So this is just the 7B model. Um, but I think even that takes like 14 uh, gigabytes of GPU memory. Um, they make reference to uh, like a model parallelism value that's either one, four, or eight, depending upon what model you have. And I haven't quite figured out if model parallelism is essentially the number, like uh, if the model parallelism number is just kind of the fancy way of saying how many GPUs you need. Um, but in any case, I'll get around to figuring that out. Uh, the test space here is just kind of where I was testing out, um, you know, this demo beforehand to make sure everything worked. This is the llama barn, which is where I keep the various, my, yeah, it's the, uh, is that really what it's called is the llama barn. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You'll notice that the, the instance host name is Bert's llama farm. And then you'll notice, uh, that's at least the mount. I think that even on, I think even on GCP, I might've named that like llama barn or something like that. So great. So, yeah. So just kind of, you know, little fun techie host name humor there. Ha ha. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, so we're, you can do better than that. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> that was, uh, yeah. Anyway, okay. um, there was, sorry, <laughs> bad joke there. I'll, I'll laugh at my own humor. Um, so we've got Code Llama, Llama. Um, obviously, a couple different directories and stuff here. If we look into this, um, this has got all of the uh, base llama chat model stuff in it. If we look at this, this is all of the uh, code llama stuff. So you also have the instruct version of um, their code one, which is essentially fine tuned for like to give instructions or to like take instructions. It's kind of, um, I haven't quite figured out exactly what the distinction is that makes something better to fine tune it for instructions, but there is a, there are a lot of places that will fine tune a model for something like that. Um, so in here, um, we've just got a bunch of different stuff. Uh, the example scripts that they give you, um, just kind of the requirements.txt, et cetera. Uh, I'll spare you looking over the readme. It's just rather dense and would be uh, probably a little difficult to cogitate in this small frame. Uh, so I'll just show you the end result of it. Um, you could just ask the model to give you a synopsis. I could. The uh, what's cool about this is that it's all um, you know, it's Python code queries against it, so you can just essentially um, write Python whole scripts, etc., that call against the model. So it's quite fun. Um, where was I at? Oh yeah, I want to cap the Lumber Barn. Uh, okay, there we go. Actually, I'm gonna bin that file. Uh, oh, sorry. So yeah, so this is the, uh, the actual container file in the end that I put together to get this all running. Uh, like I said, I kind of just um, took what they said to do in their readme and a couple of just best practices around you know updating stuff like that and uh, put it all together to make this work. 
I was honestly really impressed by how easy this was to get mm -hmm. containerized in the end. I basically just took my um, uh, like um, bash history, put it into an Aptainer, cleaned it up a little bit to format, you know, added the environment stuff like that, and uh, it it's just super simple. It works great. Um, these days, when I build, what's up, dude? Well, I was just gonna say, look at that from line. That's that's a pretty cool uh, from line up there. Um, in the uh, header, because it's nice to see, uh, you know, official NVIDIA CUDA installations on Rocky 8. Yeah, I switched over. I used to just uh, normally base my containers on um, just like the base Rocky Linux image and then do a CUDA install and then like it, well, NVIDIA driver, CUDA install, et cetera, as much as you need to do in the container over the top of that. I eventually kind of figured out that a lot of things need this QDNN. Um, and with the development version of this container that they have on in Docker, they basically include all the runtimes, uh, not the runtimes, but like all the development headers, all the stuff that things expect to be able to compile against that I usually um, was like trying to install CUDA in order to give and like make available. Um, so these days, yeah, I prefer to just use their official images. They're pretty solid. Um, and like I said, everything's based on Rocky. You can go see the um, uh, like NVIDIA CUDA install instructions and all that, and they've got a whole section for Rocky 8 and a whole section for Rocky 9 by name. So And QDNN used to have some weird licensing requirements too. So this is kind of like a really nice way to do this. I can, I can talk about that <laughs> at length at some point, but probably not right now since you've got so much interesting stuff to cover. That's not just licensing. <laughs> it floats back to me that my old module file system deployment on the last cluster I was managing had a separate module file for CUDA and then a whole bunch of separate stuff for QDNN that had to be loaded. So yeah, having it all just in one base container is fantastic. Uh, within an Aptainer, usually, uh, I actually edited this in the one in my article to make it a little more obvious. Uh, the post section runs first, and then environment adds basically this to the environment that's present in the container once the build is done. So we're going to skip over environment for a second and go to post. Um, like I said, this is pretty simple. We just do a DNF update to um, I'm not particularly concerned about like the CUDA compatibility, things being updated, et cetera, stuff like that. Um, I'm not sure if they, I've never quite ascertained, honestly, if they do this in like um, uh, like a local type install or like a network type install, like that will update this when you DNF update. Um, in this case, I just chose to do that because this is a pretty new model. It runs on pretty new GPUs and it uh, pretty much expects the latest CUDA, uh, especially because it wants to run on Python 3.9. Um, so I DNF update the container, just update that, plus all the dependencies, that type of thing. Um, you know, make sure I can actually find the Git Python 3.9, uh, 3.9 devel packages and stuff. Um, go ahead and install those. Um, make, oh, sorry, I thought that was make deer llama farm and make deer llama farm double repeated for a second. Um, no, so we make a, just kind of a working directory to store everything into and CD into it. Um, and then we just go ahead and clone the llama and code llama um, code bases. These are not the models themselves. Uh, Meta only distributes the models um, from that link that you have to get by filling out their form and stuff. And they say, don't go post these anywhere else for people to ingest. Um, so this, yeah, so this container is mostly a wrapper um, that allows you to take the models that you have on a large file. So, and you wouldn't in general, uh, well, sometimes it is useful and kind of the right thing to do. Um, generally, you find that very, very large containers are kind of unwieldy. They're difficult to push. They're difficult to pull. They're difficult for um, you know systems to ingest as an image, that type of thing. Um, so usually, you want to keep your containers as minimal as possible. And storing model files inside of them and like pulling those gigabytes and gigabytes and gigabytes of data whenever you need to um, use the model is less efficient than just storing everything on disk and like mounting it to a container like this, <clears throat> or mounting it to an instance and then just binding it into a container like I'll show you. Um, this, this brings up an interesting, I think this is an interesting thing to think about though. I mean, um, you know, it, generally, I'm sorry to jump in, no <laughs> but um, generally like, I think that it's, uh, it's a good kind of 
practice or a good thing to, to think about your containers as being like you have you've got your code you're actually you know whatever you're going to functionally run inside your container and you've got your data outside the container that you're going to operate on but it always gets a little hazy when you get into these use cases because then you get into like a model and you're like wait a minute is that data or is that code it kind of is functional it kind of is like the thing that you're going to use to do stuff but it kind of isn't too because it's kind of just a bunch of weights that you could swap out for a different set you know so it's it's like um it's always kind of a gray area i think what do you think about that i mean i know just like from a from a technical standpoint it's it's in this case it's better not to have it in the container because you want to move the container around um in general uh i'm sorry response and it just kind of popped out of my head um how flexible are these models to be able to swap in and out with different uh you know like once you've got once you've got llama installed um how tied to the version of llama or the version of whatever framework you're using is a particular model or are they usually very very flexible for the most part it's pretty static um you can pretty much uh get one version get its dependencies together in a container um and then be able to operate on that uh and yeah to touch on like data versus things i think that yeah just like you said that's a huge problem just in general whenever we're doing use cases what needs to go with the container what needs to be ingested in from somewhere um it's always kind of that fine line of what like i said is actually functional versus what is just data um in this case models uh with just how much like they used to be pretty small i mean a few megabytes so you could pack it in the container if you wanted no big deal but with you know models getting five ten gigabytes or larger um even if you're you know, at a certain point, you could, um, you know, I sometimes recommended like packing them into a layer on top of the container, um, like an extra, like an overlay image, basically. But it's just uh, a lot of the times easier to just put them on disk and have something that can persistently mount that to a cloud instance or just have something similar on prem. Um, ultimately, uh, AI is truly another HPC use case. So there's a lot of kind of like, oh, is, is HPC, I've heard people asking, oh, well, is HPC ready for AI? HPC and AI have already been the same thing for a long time. So, uh, you know, uh, the, <laughs> there are larger use cases that go on, um, even just in HPC that have, you know, more storage, uh, more data going into them, et cetera. Um, and so AI, while it still has some room to scale, its biggest problem is just like getting larger and larger GPUs. Um, definitely, uh, kind of interesting deployment strategies on how you actually get um, the models out there. But yeah, the uh, uh, as far as like swapping them in and out, um, I would imagine you can probably, like this uh, container I imagine as it sits is probably good for, um, you could probably hot swap this with the 13B, the 70B, and it would work the same way because they all have basically the same dependencies. Um, and so, yeah. They, uh, they tend to be fairly flexible. Sometimes you used to run into a lot of issues with like older GPUs, because sometimes like if it's got a newer, cuter version, it won't like older stuff. Um, but all in all, I've always found, uh, well, the, the old GPT ones were kind of starting to get a little bit aged, but um, when stuff is cutting edge, it tends to you know have a period that it works pretty well for. Um, and meta, this llama stuff is pretty actively updated as well. So I anticipate stuff will stay compatible for a bit. Um, yeah, so just to uh, finish up what I was saying about the container here. Um, like I said, we go ahead and pull in the actual code bases themselves that we need. Uh, so we bring in, you know, like I said, the functional part of this container that isn't just the data we're going to end up ingressing in the end. Um, we cd into that file. It's literally just an upgrade pip so it can find um, the latest versions of Torch and uh, the different CUDA compatibility wheels and stuff like that. Um, upgrades pip. Uh, upgrades kind of just, um, like I said, the, uh, the package repository when you do that for Python. Um, you just do a pip install dash e dot, which pulls that requirements file and that type of stuff in. Um, feeds that into Python, it reaches out, finds Torch, all the dependencies, 
uh, puts it into a uh, um, Python environment. And at the end, we do a DNF clean just to make sure that uh, we're not storing a whole bunch of large uh, CUDA RPMs and stuff like that. Um, and just to, in general, make the container smaller because that's a good thing to do whenever you get done with a container. Uh, so yeah, we go ahead and build this on the architecture. Um, and I'm going to go over to my actually test space to show you this. Well, actually, we'll just... yeah. So we've got uh, this is the result of building this. It's a 9.2 gigabyte container in the end, even with just that, um, uh, even without all the model files in it. Uh, just because GPU code and libraries and stuff like that, those containers tend to be weighty. So you can see how if we were putting, you know, another five to 10 gigabytes of models, pretty soon we'd be moving 20 gigabytes over the network whenever we want to ingress this. Um, so instead, we're sitting here on this, uh, like I said, mounted volume. To actually go ahead and run this container here, um, we're going to go ahead and scroll back up in the history to get the command to make sure that I get it right. There we go. So this is kind of a long command, um, but once we've gone ahead and done the, well, I'll just show you. When we build this container, we do an obtainer build dash dash nv llama 2.sif uh, llama dash 2.def. And it's just that simple to put this one together. Um, we have to do the uh, NV stuff so that it um, kind of correctly finds what it needs to find out there. It's always a little ambiguous. Um, sometimes uh, I find that these container builds will not find what they need to find without that. Generally, when you use the base container from NVIDIA, it's pretty resilient. Um, but just to make sure we're getting um, all the most accurate stuff, we go ahead and build that. I, um, yeah, I, I saw that, and I was I was wondering about that. You probably anticipated I was going to wonder like about the uh, dash dash nv during build. Hmm. So it, it 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 like it's my understanding that typically when you're building this kind of stuff, there's stub files in the NVIDIA containers that it can uh, link against without actually having the actual libraries. Okay. I wonder if you if you if you uh, add that dash dash nv option. Do you know so what what that's doing obviously it's is it's grabbing the the driver libraries from the host system and putting them into the container at at build time now and i guess presumably linking against them do you know if that's gonna uh, negatively impact the portability of this container at all um it's possible that it does i i'm half thinking that this nv and the dnf clean all were holdovers from an older version of this when i was installing the cuda manually before i just decided to switch over and use the base container in this or for this one mm. um okay but it's also possible that i just added it out of habit and forgot to take it out so that's a good um that, that's good to point out dave it's possible you don't actually need the nv here uh, especially because we have that base container yeah um, it'd be it'd be interesting to see so yeah, it may have just been that I added that out of habit. I think it's, uh, for the most part, um, does it uh, does it inject the GPU device files into the container if you don't use dash dash nv? Because that's the only one thing that I can think of is that it might be like, uh, you might get to like the Python section, it'll just say no compatible GPUs or something like that found because it doesn't have the device file. But anyway, it probably warrants maybe more testing. Yeah, I don't know that it injects the. I don't know that that adding the dash dash nv option will inject the device files. Um, it could because th that's a relative. That's a relatively new option with the build mm -hmm. command. Um, so it could be that it sets up device it, where it by mounts the device files into the container. But I'm not sure. I I, I kind of don't think it does, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, well, NV has always been a little bit of, or the NV option has always been the bane of my existence for a while now. Maybe one of these days I'll finally, I'll finally get it. <laughs> um, anyway, this builds. Um, we get this large container out of this, um, and then we're free to begin doing this right here. Um, so just to kind of explain this entire line, uh, first off, in some versions of Aptainer, um it will bind the current working 
sorry, I thought that switching windows made it actually switch windows on this thing. Um, you'll find that in some versions of Obtainer, it binds the current working directory that uh, of the container itself. Sometimes it binds the working directory of the script being run. Um, so it, you might have to mess with it a little bit depending upon what version you have in order to get the bind to work right. Um, in this case, we're just binding in this mount llama bar barn into mount llama barn in the container. I'm going to make sure that's there. I use dash MV. Like I said, once again, it's potential this isn't necessary. Um, but uh, in general, I, that option always kind of confuses me a little bit. I'm going to switch this to uh, llama2.sif for this working directory that we're in. Uh, this was from what I was using the test space earlier. And then we have this torch run uh, long command here that basically just kind of is their standard way of running these scripts. Um, so we're just running this example chat completion script, which has just kind of some uh, random queries that they put in there. I think it asked me, what's a recipe for mayonnaise? What's uh, like, how do you get from Beijing to New York, but explain it in emojis, which I was amusingly, which when I first saw, I was very amused to find, showed me that the terminal has emoji support, which I didn't realize. <laughs> Uh, wait, 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 Forrest, I feel like you are teasing us right now. No, I'll show you. I'll, I'll run this, this here in the plane. This is, okay, yeah, okay, thank you. So, yes, okay, so you're, you're telling us what you did, and then you're going to show us. Yeah, I'll go ahead and run it, and we'll see if this, <laughs> uh, we'll see if I, I switch everything over that I need to switch. But, yeah, the um, torch run and proc per node, just one, because we've only got one GPU. We're running this example chat completion script. Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, this right here is the checkpoint directory. Oh, wait. I put my tokenizer. Oh. Live demo. I think that's right. OK, so yeah, um, we have to provide the checkpoint directory, which is basically just the directory of the um, uh, where all the model files are at. So like I showed you earlier with the llama bar and the llama file and then all these directories inside of it, these are the directories that you get from Meta when you run their download script with the link that they give you. Um, so you get basically all of these uh, directories that it downloads everything into, and then you can just reference them with checkpoint directory like that. The tokenizer path, this took me a little bit to figure out. I got kind of tripped up on this because I was like, where does the tokenizer come from? But then I realized, I think the tokenizer comes from when you uh, like pull the download from them. So I was trying to run this container and it kept saying it couldn't find the tokenizer. And finally I was like, oh, the tokenizer isn't actually there. Um, so you might have to get that into a certain place. Ah, oh, there we go. So let me scroll back up and finish what I was saying, and then I'll show you these results. Um, uh, max sequence length, the match batch size are just kind of random uh, AI uh, options that kind of tell it what type of response to give, how long, et cetera. Um, but you can see that this worked. So we've gone ahead and run this. Uh, it goes ahead and finds the GPU. It starts to initialize the model. Um, and once again, we're using obtainer exec here. So I'm just calling basically this command on this container right here with like the bind and NV options applied to it. Um, but you can see we get these initializing model parallel pipelines. Um, it loads in a pretty quick amount of seconds because we're here on this uh, uh, A100. And then, like I said, we get kind of these random queries that uh, Meta just, I haven't changed their default input script, but just, um, you know, recipe for mayonnaise. I'm going to Paris. What should I see? Always answer with a haiku. Always <laughs> answer with emojis. How do you go from Beijing to New York? So you can see the terminal does actually have emoji support. Um, <laughs> they've got the, you know, the the initial prompting. You are a helpful, respectful, and honest assistant. You can sometimes get OpenAI like ChatGPT to divulge its initial prompting text that it starts before every conversation. That's like, you are a large language model created by OpenAI. It is your job to helpfully answer questions and not to be, you know, this list of, you know, harmful, unethical, racist, sexist, et cetera. 
Um, they've kind of made it so it's more difficult, but there was a while where everyone was like, oh, look, you can get it to tell it. Like, it's one, like, the one-shot prompt that they give it beforehand. Um, you write a brief birthday message to John, stuff like that. Who's and John? Then, John who? Oh, I have no idea. Oh, John, I thought it was somebody's birthday. No, it's not. No, definitely not. It's, uh, like I said, it must be a John at Meta somewhere. That's just their example. Um, it, it's always kind of funny, the text that AI produces. It's always, like, the most, like, version-y version of that text that something can be. Like, you ask it, you know, write a cover letter, and it'll give you the most cover lettery cover letter you've ever written. It'll cover all the bases to the point where you're looking at it like, you know, it's almost like too good. Like you got to leave out, you know, you got to remember to forget something in it. You know, the, uh, <laughs> the thank you for your consideration, you know, the I did this, that. There's got to be some type of flaw in it. Um, I noticed that the uh, recipe for mayonnaise was a legit recipe. Was it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know. Did I was it looking at it too. Let's take a look. I, yeah, what's funny about these is that uh, sometimes they've really struggled with logic. Um, so like a lot of people have kind of said that ChatGPT has gone downhill over this year, which is not entirely out of the realm of possibility. As they add more like content controls, kind of stuff like that, the uh, its ability to kind of maneuver in a response gets more and more, it thinks it at least is more and more limited. Um, and so people have like asked it at the start of the year, can you pick out these prime numbers? And it does it perfectly. Now people claim it can't. Um, spatial reasoning is really difficult for large language models. Like try asking one, uh, you have a book, a sphere and an open cylinder. How can you stack these items most efficiently? And it'll say like stack everything on top of the sphere and the cylinder, just like in a way that it would, is totally illogical. Um, and so it's fascinating how it's not just about, you know, human like text, but, uh, it's incredible how much you can encode just in text itself. Like this whole, you know, the concept of logic, spatial reasoning, all that. It's it's not just text. It's well, you know, I wonder if that's really a failing of the model, or if it's more of a, you know, if it's more of a an artifact of the data. Like if you give, a, you know, if you take a random sample of people off the street and give them a list of numbers and say pick out the primes, um, you're going to get a lot of people point. who can't do it. And so <laughs> maybe it's, you know, correct for the model to be unable to do it. Exactly. So it's, yeah, so there we have, uh, we definitely can see how large scale um, sociological and psychological factors from the human experience can be baked into these models without us even realizing it. So, you know, this is one of the greatest arguments against giving these things too much control and stuff is because there really are you know, even beyond just like the obvious biases that things can have, there really are like large scale patterns of human behavior that are unintentionally encoded into these. So it's, it's you know, they're, they are a fascinating black box to jump into. Um, while I have a couple of minutes, um, let me do this really quickly. And I, I will point out that in my previous example, I did not say if you just gave me a list of prime numbers or of numbers, and that's <laughs> all times, I might be unable to do it because, of course, I could. You know, everybody in this call could. It's just the people on the street. <laughs> I'm betting. I think I we're totally, prove this theory. We're I totally, we're gonna, <laughs> yeah, don't give me a list. Please don't give me a list. Next time we're hanging out, Dave, we're finding a street <laughs> and doing this. <laughs> Can you, like, preface by explaining what a prime number is again? It's been a while. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> just oh, straight God. into it jk i think i can probably figure that one out <laughs> i think some of like the largest distributed computing projects in history of people like pooling their computing power have been like the prime hunts i think sometimes in recent years those have come under fire because there's some of like the most inefficient computing possible because it's usually just using like whatever backroom desktop pc people have so it's the power for performance ratio is a little low um, but here in this, uh, right here, the power for performance ratio is definitely not low. Just jump into here. This, uh, article and, or this webinar is also kind of in an article, um, that we've got posted up on the CIQ blog that I put together. So feel free to take a look at that to get the model file, the examples, um, kind of the uh, the basics of what I've shown here. Let me hop onto this quickly. 
I've uh, seen some updates recently in what we're doing with our platform here with the ability to persist storage and do like persistent volumes that I'm very excited to apply to this. Um, but for now, just to show you really quickly. So I'll, I'll riff a little bit while you're bringing that up. So just, uh, I think that you're bringing up now fuzzball. Mm -hmm. And so for those of you who have not been religiously watching each and every one of our webinars, Fuzzball is the orchestration platform for HPC that, uh, you know, orchestrates based on jobs rather than services and is optimized for things like AI workloads. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there you go, Rose. There we go, Rose. Oh. Thank you. Perfect. Yes. Yeah, so Fuzzball is a really cool platform. Uh, I'm always thrilled to get to show it off. Um, we've This is basically the exact same thing that you just saw me do here, but as a Fuzzball workflow. Um, so I can show you we've got you know, our definition over here. We've, well, actually, I'll start with the jobs. Uh, this workflow is pretty simple. We just create our Llama Barn storage volume. We pull our container image, which is the same image that I just showed you um, us running out of on this GCP. I basically just... Um, took that image, uploaded it directly to our, uh, our artifact registry and I'm pulling it into this. Uh, you'll notice that in from S3, I'm pulling the, uh, the model file and the tokenizer. Like I said, this is kind of what I was saying about not wanting to ingress these because like always bringing in this 10 gigabytes over the network uh, is gonna you know, be slow. Um, so like I said, I'm very excited to test out some new stuff we've had recently with uh, persistent volumes more to kind of tinker with that. Um, but this brings in the tokenizer and the model file. Um, we then basically just untar both of those and get those uh, in the right place. And then we run, like I said, that same bit of code that we just ran in the last um, uh, demo. Um, and you can see in our workflow editor, we've got uh, that torch run, chat completion, basically like same type of thing going on there. We're requesting uh, four CPU cores, 58 GB bytes of memory, and a GPU. This is going to land us on a V100. So I think that 14 um, uh, gigabytes of memory works within the confines of a 16 gigabyte V100. And we can, of course, and that'll, uh, well, we won't have time to see this finish. Um, you can see that. Uh, this workflow runs on Fuzzball. And like I said, that um, I'll just show you the previous result that I was on there. We can see that in here, we have that same, what's the recipe of mayonnaise? I'm going to Paris, that type of thing. So that's uh, that's been my experience with containerizing large language models using uh, Aptainer this year. It's, uh, it's been very exciting. Like I said, there's been a lot of kind of just sitting and waiting for things to um, kind of move and kind of create standards. Uh, but um, kind of with this huge recent success and getting Llama working and getting it containerized and stuff like that, I'm uh, super excited to kind of, like I said, dive into my, my own projects around AI more, especially now that we have uh, what seems like such a solid standard to base off of. So. That's very cool. Wait, Forrest, are you going to post somewhere in your blog the actual definition file that you had there? It's in there right now. Excellent. Yep, that you can go just copy like that. that. I yeah, like I said, paste it right onto um, you know wherever your GPUs are sold, and uh, get that uh, get that up and running. Of course, like I said, I and I think all of us, we in general, highly recommend that GCP optimized Rocky Linux. It like I said, works fantastic and. Uh, I had nothing but smooth performance the entire time while I was deploying an entire AI workload on it. Excellent. Thank you for showing that for us. Dave, Oops. it's always good to see you. Thanks for being here too. Yeah, thanks for letting Rose. me hang out. This has been a really, really cool demo for us. Absolutely. Thank you for joining Dave and uh, thank you for being here, Zane and Rose, to host as well. Yeah, that was awesome. All right, well, I'll ask my millions of questions later. Um, and for now, though, you guys, we are done. So make sure that you like and subscribe, share this with friends, enjoy Llama. <laughs> Call us if you want to talk about Fuzzball. And uh, we will see you same time, same place next week. Enjoy your day. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Yes.